Hi and welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Vince. Thanks for stopping by. You're very welcome here indeed. So a new study out of New Zealand, the University of Otago, has shown that six minutes of a specific type of exercise boosts a protein in the brain that can fend off diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Enough waffling off me, let's jump into the presentation and see what this new study out of New Zealand has got to offer. This is a review of a piece I read that was penned by the Physiological Society, where they cover a study that was published in the Journal of Physiology, looking into how six minutes of this particular type of exercise per day could delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease and boost our health span. And there are links in the description below to the study and the articles I used to put this presentation together. Six minutes of high intensity exercise could extend the lifespan of a healthy brain and delay the onset of neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. This new research published in the Journal of Physiology showed that a short but intense bout of cycling increases the production of a specialized protein that is essential for brain formation, learning and memory and could protect the brain from age related cognitive decline. This insight on exercise is part of a drive to develop accessible, equitable and affordable non-pharmacological approaches that anyone can adopt to promote a healthy ageing regime. The specialised protein named Brain Derived Neutrophic Factor or BDNF promotes neuroplasticity and the survival of our neurons. Neuroplasticity is the mechanism by which the brain forms new connections and new pathways. Animal studies have shown that increasing the availability of BDNF encourages the formation and the storage of memories, enhances learning and overall boosts cognitive performance. These key roles and its apparent neuroprotective qualities have led to more interest into BDNF for anti-aging research. Travis Gibbons, a PhD candidate at the University of Otago and lead author of the study said, BDNF has shown great promise in animal models, but pharmaceutical interventions have thus far failed to safely harness the protective power of BDNF in humans. We saw the need to explore non-pharmacological approaches that can preserve the brain's capacity, which humans can use to naturally increase BDNF to help with healthy aging. To tease apart the influence of fasting and exercise on BDNF production, the researchers from the University of Otago, New Zealand, compared the following factors to study the isolated and the interactive effects. First was fasting for 20 hours. Second was light exercise, which was 90 minutes of low intensity cycling. Third was high intensity exercise, and this was six minute bouts of vigorous cycling. And fourth was a combination of fasting and exercise. Let's quickly look at the difference between low and high intensity exercise, just in case you'd like to try the high intensity regime. There are many definitions. These from Northside Allied Health are representative of most that I found. Low intensity is referred to any form of physical activity performed at a steady state requiring roughly 50% of your maximum heart rate and with no rest period. High intensity training, more commonly referred to as HIT, high intensity interval training, involves performing levels of vigorous exercise for a shorter duration, usually requiring up to 95% of your maximum heart rate and then resting briefly before the next exercise period. So let's see what they found out. The researchers found that brief but vigorous exercise was the most efficient way to increase BDNF and this was compared to one day of fasting and that was with or without a lengthy session of light exercise. High intensity exercise increased BDNF by four to five fold, an increase of 774 points. Fasting showed no change in BDNF concentration whatsoever. Low intensity prolonged activity showed a light increase in BDNF concentration, an increase of only 54 points. Now, the cause for these differences is not yet known and more research is needed to fully understand the mechanisms that are involved. 
one hypothesis is related to the cerebral substrate switch and glucose metabolism, the brain's primary fuel source. The substrate switch is defined as the time when the brain switches its favoured fuel source from one to another to ensure the body's energy demands are met. For example, metabolizing lactate rather than glucose during exercise. The brain's transition from consuming glucose to lactate initiates pathways that result in elevated levels of BDNF in the blood. A second hypothesis is that the observed increase in BDNF during exercise may also be due to the increased number of platelets. These are the smallest of our blood cells, which store large amounts of BDNF. The concentration of platelets circulating in the blood is more heavily influenced by exercise than by fasting and increases by 20%. Let's quickly talk about the cohort. They were 12 physically active participants, six males and six females, who were aged between 18 and 56. The balance ratio of male and female participants was to provide a better representation of the population rather than indicate the differences in sex. Further research is underway to dive deeper into the effects of calorie restriction and exercise to look into the influence of BDNF and its cognitive benefits. Lead author of the study, Travis Gibbons, closed by saying, we are now studying how fasting for longer durations, for example, up to three days, influences BDNF. We are curious as to whether exercising hard at the start of a fast accelerates the beneficial effects of fasting. Fasting and exercise are rarely studied together. We think that fasting and exercise can be used in conjunction to optimize BDNF production in the human brain. Well, I hope you found that interesting or informative, hopefully both. So it looks as though from this study, six minutes hit exercise a day could be enough to fend off the diseases of aging, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, which is a good thing because people afflicted with this disease is terrible, not only for them, but also for the friends and family around them. I have to see them live through this day by day. Uh, I've crunched some numbers. I've gone through what I think are the stats with regard to myself. Uh, I'd like to let I'd like you to let me know in the comments below whether or not you think I'm close or if I'm a long way out. So my exercise app shows me my light and intensive heart rate scores and then breaks down my aerobic, anaerobic and VO2 max scores. From the research I've done as part of this presentation, um, high intensity I think could be drawn from the scores when I'm in the intensive or my anaerobic or, vi or my VO2 max zones. On a CrossFit day, I average around one hour intensive, 10 minutes aerobic, six minutes anaerobic and between three and five minutes VO2 max. That's not all in the gym because obviously I walk around during the day, I use the stairs to get to work. And after uh, CrossFit exercise, it's about eight to 10 minute walk back to the car when my heart rate, although I'm not doing intensive work, is still up and it's not resting. I've got a 15 minute drive home when it's starting to slow down. Uh, then I'm in the shower. It's probably about 40 minutes after I finished the workout till I'm actually sat on the sofa showered and my heart rate can start to come down properly. Um, on non-gym days, I average about 40 minutes intensive, five minutes aerobic, and about uh, none, no anaerobic or VO2 max whatsoever. So I think for the average person, for me on a CrossFit day, I'm only getting into the to the hit stage, so VO2 max and intensive, for probably about five or six minutes, which, which is what they say. On my non-training days, uh, I'm not. I'm nowhere near. Uh, VO2 max whatsoever or intensive, so I'm not going to be getting the, the scores that they require. I think it's a big ask for anyone to get into VO2 max or intensive for six minutes every day of the week. That means, and you can't just exercise, hit VO2 max straight away, exercise for six minutes and then stop. You've got to build up to that. So it's going to take you 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes a, a day to get your six minutes worth of hit. And I think 15 to 20 minutes exercise a day and getting into hit for six minutes or getting into VO2 max for six minutes is gonna be difficult. Getting into VO2 max is extremely uncomfortable uh, and to do it for six minutes is even more uncomfortable. And to know you've got to do this every day for the rest of your life may be, I think, a very big ask. Let me know what you think in the comments below.